Okay. So, for example, the first row tells us that supplier S1, which is Smith, supplied part P1, which is a nut, okay, to project J1, which is a solder. Right? And how many pieces did he supply? 200. Right? Now, how do we know that the first row is talking about Smith? How do we know that the first row in the shipments is really talking about the supplier Smith and not supplier Blake? By the number, S1. Right? It says S1, right? The supplier number is S1, and Smith's supplier number is S1. That is how you know that this is Smith. Okay? That's all. That is the relational model. Okay? And this was the huge revolution in information systems. Can you believe it? One of, the, one of the most significant inventions in computer science was the relational model. Now suppose somebody asked you to say, how will you represent this information? Is it likely that you would have come up with something like this? It looks really simple, right? But this is the last of the various models that people tried out. The relational model. It says this is how you can represent information. Okay. Now it's difficult to see what is so great about this, but it's you know, it, it's a phenomenal leap in information systems, in, in computer science, really. A fellow called uh, Cord, E.F. Cord, was the one who came up with this and came out from IBM. They did a lot of research, and there's a phenomenal mathematical basis to say that this is really one of the best ways to represent information. But it's really simple. We don't have to, you know, know all the mathematical theorems to understand that, uh, to understand what information this is representing. Okay. Any questions about this? So that's a database that is giving you information about suppliers, parts, projects, and shipments. Okay. All the shipments that have been made by various suppliers of various parts to various projects. Okay. That's a database. It's a database schema. Now what can we do with this information? Okay, great. What can we do with this? What, yeah. You can... Right, you can extract all kinds of information from this data. For example, okay, oh, by the way, before we jump into that, note that in a relational model, all the data is represented only in the form of tables. Nothing else. Okay, they just, you just have tables. Any connections between the tables are made through data values. Like for example, we said, right, how do we know that that is Smith? Because S1 was there, S1 was here. You know, that's the connection, right? So the connection between those two tables occurred simply by the presence of common data values. That's it. That's the simple relational model. Now, once you have this kind of data represented in the form of a relational model, what can you do with it? Like Michelle said, we can answer all kinds of queries. Right? These are simply examples of queries that I made. Why? Uh, seven queries, well, that just enough to fill up the page, that's all. It could come up with hundreds of more queries, literally. Right? It says, uh, how many suppliers are there? We know there are five. It can be, that information can be gleaned from this schema. List the parts that weigh between 15 and 18 kilos. List projects that have received no shipments. Right? You, you could go through the data and answer that question. Right? For example, uh, how many suppliers are there? There are six suppliers. Which suppliers are located in Paris? You can answer that question, or you can answer questions, list projects that have received no shipments. How will you answer that query, for example? Is there such a project? J1, J2, J3, J4, J5, there is no such project. Right? There are seven projects, J1 to J7, and all of them appear somewhere in this, right? That means list projects that have received no shipments. There's no such project. We can answer that question. Right? And we can answer all of these other questions as well. Right? Now the beauty is that at the time you designed your database and said these are the tables we'll have, you didn't need to really think about what are all the queries I might have to answer. Right? And that is the beauty of entity relationship diagrams. You say, well, these are the entities. And we'll come to all this. I mean, those who have not done Enterprise One, don't get scared. 
Everything is going to be broken out in excruciating detail. Don't worry. Uh, so you say these are the entities. These are all the relationships. Once I represent all of this, I sit back and say, look, now you throw any query at me, I can answer it. This representation can take care of anything you can think of. Okay. That is the power of the relational model, really. You represent the data, and then all queries can be answered. Okay. This is just some examples of relational database products that are out there. Okay, The Big Daddy is Oracle. That's the Microsoft of databases. They do all the bad things that Microsoft does in the database field. Okay, uh, So they are the market leaders there. Microsoft is there with the SQL Server. It's just not as big a product. IBM has its product. In fact, these are the guys who invented the relational database. Okay, But they are not the leaders today. And then, of course, you've got MySQL. And this product is called PostgreSQL. Right? The good thing about the top two, they're both free products. Okay? So you feel like having a database now, you don't have to pay anybody anything. Just download it, use it. And they're very powerful too. I mean, they're industrial strength databases that you can use. Okay? These are just all the products that will do the same thing. Okay? They'll have their small twists and turns, but pretty much they all, they're all relational models. Okay. Now, some concepts about relational models, again, I might be, uh, you know, those who have done Enterprise One, you know all of these things, but just bear with me. I just want to set the uh, tone here. Okay? Every table in a relational database must have something called as a primary key. Right? Primary key. Uh, example, the great example of primary key is your SHU ID. Right? We've got our cards. I have it in my pocket. Right? The back of it, there's a number. And that is my shoe ID. That's a unique identifier that identifies me. Right? There may be 10 other people in this university who have the same name as me. Very unlikely, but it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. But what will distinguish me from another person with my same name would be the number. Right? That's the unique identifier, or that's the primary key. In a similar sense, a supplier, you, know, you may have 10 suppliers who are all called Clark. But what is the difference between one clock and another clock? Everything else may be identical, but the supplier number is going to be unique. Okay? That's called as the primary key. Okay? Every table has to have a field or fields which are the primary key, and that value of that field will uniquely identify a particular entity. Okay? So that is why all of those values will be different. S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. I can't have another S1. But just like you can't have two people with the same shoe ID. That, that's the idea. That's the primary key. So that's the primary key field, supplier number, SNUM. Right? And these are all the primary key values that exist in the table. Okay? So when you say, what is the primary key for the supplier table? You say, well, the primary key for the supplier table is SNUM, the supplier number. Okay? Just concepts. Okay? Any given value for a primary key field can occur at most once in a table. You can't have two S1s in the supplier table. Okay. Now, sometimes primary keys are compound. That is, a primary key need not always be made of just one field. Okay. It's possible that a primary key may be constructed out of many fields. For example, in the shipment table, right? I'll just jump back to the shipment table itself. Okay. If you look at the shipment table, right, you see that supplier number, part number, project number, quantity. Now, what is it that uniquely identifies a row? You can't say just supplier number because the same supplier number can occur many times. Right? Now, why would that happen? Why would the same supplier number occur many times in the table? The supplier made many shipments. Okay? The shipments, the same supplier, I might be the supplier. I supply to your project, her project, her project, and his project. So I'm going to occur as many times as I made shipments. So that is not the primary key. Similarly, project number is not the primary key because the project may have received many shipments from many different suppliers. Okay? And you know, part number also is not the key. The same part may have been supplied to many projects. Right? But what is unique in this table is the combination. Right? So the combination cannot repeat as per this design. You may say in real life it can repeat. Of course it can. The same supplier can supply the same part to the same project many times. But that scenario is not considered here. Right? Here we assume that just once. So the combination is unique, and therefore, the primary key for that table 
is uh, the combination of all of those. Okay, that's called as a primary key, but it's compound because it's not one field; it's multiple fields. Okay, so that's the idea of a primary key. Now, when you put a primary key of one table as a field in another table, for example, supply a number is the primary key of the supply table. Right? Class number is the primary key of the class table, and class number J number is the primary key of the class table. Okay, so there are three different primary keys, but this table is not any of those tables. This is a completely different table in which those fields. The term for this is these are called common keys. That is, it's a field in this table which happens to be the primary key for some other field. The terminology they are used to describe that is a common key. Right? And what is the purpose of foreign keys? Relationships. Right? Foreign key is what allows you to establish a relationship between this table and that other table. Like we said, S1 from the supplier table, from the Shipments table was also present in the supplier table. That is how you knew that the supplier who made that shipment was this supplier. Right? So foreign keys allow relationships. That's the main purpose. Okay. Now the beauty of, uh, of the relational model is that it allows you to create a language called structured query language or SQL. Now before you get started, we're not going to learn SQL in this course. Okay, I'm just laying out some features. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We can have a lot of fun learning SQL, but it's unlikely that you will ever be sitting down and writing SQL. Okay. Um, but the beauty is the relational model allows you to have a language called SQL. And SQL language has two important features which are related. Okay. The first feature is SQL is a non-procedural language. Can you make a guess as to what this might mean? What is non-procedural? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. It's, it's a new term. You know, if somebody had asked me this when I was a student, I would have given the same blank stare. <laughs> it it's not, you know, not like I said candy or something. Something completely. We'll discuss it. And it also preserves what is called data independence. Both of these are important concepts that we'll just touch upon so that you know, whenever you talk about relational databases, you can throw these terms and appear you know, a little nerdy, if that's what you want. Okay? So what is non-procedural? Well, non-procedural is when you give, when you ask somebody for something. Right? In this case, a program is going to ask a database for data. Right? So the program simply says, look, give me a list of all projects that have not received any shipments. That's it. The program is simply making a request for data. It's saying what it wants, but it's not saying how the database should go about finding it out. Right? It's not laying out a procedure by which the request can be satisfied. It's simply making the request. Okay? Now, why is that significant? Let's take an example. Right? You just come to a new city. You want to go somewhere. You don't know the city. What do you do? You get into the cab and say, you know, take me to, uh, you know, the Best Western on 53rd Street, or some such thing. Right? That's what you tell the cabbie. That's a non-procedural way of describing your your request. Right? What would be a procedural way of describing your request? Right, go straight, make a right at this street, make a left at that street. Oh, wait, 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 you know, make a right there. You're sitting down and giving detailed instructions to the to the driver. That's a procedural way of saying where do you want to go. A non-procedural is simply to say, take me there and you fall asleep. Okay? The cabbie knows the city, he drives. He may take you, you know, <laughs> round and round. You don't know, you're at his, at his mercy. Right? So you reach the place. That's non-procedural. Now what is the benefit of a non-procedural way of saying something? Why is it an advantage? What is that? Why is that an advantage? Oh, you, you're saying you'll get it, you'll get exactly what you want. Right? Okay. That's an advantage. 
Another advantage is you don't need to know the details. It's a new city. If you have to give procedural instructions, you have to know the city. Right? You don't have to know the city. You just get in and say, take me there. And the, the rest of the problem of finding out the exact route, that is left to the cab. Right? You don't have to know the details. Right? And furthermore, you're not hurt if any details change. For example, suppose you went to that city three years ago. Right? And you know exactly, and you knew at that time exactly how to get to that hotel. But now things have changed. There are new roads. Some roads have become one way. Some roads don't exist. Okay? So now you try to give the old directions, you might end up in the garbage dump. Right? You may not reach the hotel that you're planning to reach. So if anything changes, you're affected because you tried to know the details. But now you say, you tell the cabbie, take me there. The cabbie knows all the changes that have taken place. So he'll take you there right away. Okay? So the advantage of non-procedural is that you don't have to know the details. And furthermore, when the details change, you're not affected because you've given the responsibility to somebody else. Just like we said. Okay? So the database manager or the cab driver decides how to navigate your request. Okay? That is the beauty of non-procedural. Right? And this, this non-procedural stuff is possible, you know, although it may not be <laughs> obvious, it's possible simply because of the relational model. There have been other database models that came before the relational model. And in all of those non-procedural uh, query languages were not possible. Okay? So that is the great thing about this. Okay? The second point I said is that it preserves data independence. Okay? What that means is if the organization of data changes, right, the program is not affected because the program never got involved with those details. Program simply says, give me this. And the database manager figures out how to give that. Right? So it roads close, you know, there's, this has become one way, that has become one way. It doesn't matter. You simply say, take me to that place and the cabbie is going to take you there. Okay? The details that have changed do not affect you. That is data independence. Okay? These are two very important advantages of the relational database model. Okay? Now, of course, if this were a database course, I would be dancing for five days around this topic, but this is not. Okay? So it looks innocuous, but it's really very important. Okay, so now we jump into entity relationship modeling. Because entity relationship modeling is what allows you to design relational databases. I again emphasize, we're not going to be designing relational databases. We're only going to be looking at databases that have been designed. But when we look at an ER diagram, we need to be able to fully understand it. So we need to understand the basic concepts. This is a repetition for those who have done Enterprise One, but I hope it's also a good refresher. Okay. So the basic things in entity relationship diagrams, of course, are, as you can guess, no mystery, entities and relationships. Right? An entity is basically, you know, we use the term entity, but we're really talking about what are called entity types. Right? And they're essentially a category of things about which an organization needs to store data. Okay? No big deal. Things like customer, supplier, shipment, project. All of these are entities. Right? Because we want to keep track of who our customers are, who our suppliers are, what are the shipments. These are all things that an organization is interested in. So we have entities. Okay? But entities represent a category. Right? Now that's the difference between the customer, the entity customer, and a specific customer. Okay? It's a whole category. So in other words, an entity is like a table. Right? If we go back here. Right? In an ER diagram, each of these things would be just one entity. You know, there would be an entity. These are all specific entity instances. Okay. So in an entity relationship diagram, we're only talking about the categories, which are supplier, part, project, and so on. We're not talking about specific supplier, specific project, and so on. Okay. That's just the distinction of uh, between entity and entity, uh, entity type and entity instance. So an entity instance, as opposed to an entity type, okay, is a specific occurrence of an entity type. Right? So what might be an example of entity instance? Supplier S1 would be an instance of the entity type supplier. Or customer X would be an instance of the entity type customer, and so on. 
Okay. So the distinction between entity type and entity instance is what we are getting at here.